Today's scriptural selections are from the book of Matthew. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod had heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet had, has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having, and having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Thank you, Todd. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Um, I realize we have the technology here. I don't have it at my other churches, so I should have loaded it, Candace. Um, there are these two guys that do Christian content comedy, and they're called the Skit Guys. Oh, God. You know how you can turn to one YouTube video and then just keep watching? Oh, if you stumble upon their website, it's such good content, and it's all Christian-based. And they have this video, and... I'm not sure the title of it, but it's the four wise men. It's not just the three wise men as in the original biblical story, but there's this fourth wise man, and he's nothing but a thorn in their side. He's like, he's got them lost. He's given them bad directions. He hasn't shut up like me. And so he's just annoyed them, and he's just been a nuisance. And so they're, they're finally getting close, and they're like, now everybody's got their gifts, right? And he's like, yeah, yeah, mine's something delicious. And they're like, what did you bring? And he's like, hummus. So his fancy box has hummus in it. Um, so, and then, so they, they really, they finally all lose their cool on him. And he's just like, I just thought it wouldn't matter what I brought this tiny king of Jews. He's going to change our world. What does it matter what I bring him? And so it really is a cute video. Um, if you are on Facebook, it's on Facebook on our church website. It's, it's a cute one. So our gospel lesson this morning is from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Todd read it. The story of the wise men, otherwise called Magi. Matthew loved the Magi. He gave their story more square inches of text than he gave the narrative of the birth of Jesus. He never even mentions the shepherds or the manger, but he didn't want us to miss out on the star and the seekers. And it's easy to see why. Their story is our story. We're all travelers. In order to find Jesus, every one of us needs direction, and God gives it. So the story of the wise men shows us how. So now when I mention that we're all travelers, um, I, I, I should skip the joke about if the wise men would have been wise women, we would have stopped earlier to ask for directions, and then it wouldn't have taken us several months to two years to reach baby Jesus. But let's give the men a little bit more credit than that. Maybe they were traveling with small children, so they were stopping to put to quench some sibling uh, sputes, and, um, or maybe they had to go to the bathroom a lot. So maybe, maybe that's what happened. But let, let's give the men some credit for this long trip to Jerusalem. So who exactly were the Magi? Magi were professors and philosophers of their day. 
They were brilliant scholars of medicine, history, religion, prophecy, and astronomy. They were also trained in what we call astrology. In their day, astrology was connected to man's search of God. The ancients studied the skies in order to find the answers to the great questions of life, like who am I, why am I here, and where am I going? So there's a difference between astronomy and astrology. Astronomy is the science of studying the, star, studying the stars, and astrology is the belief that there's a connection between the stars and our human destiny. And the Magi were experts in both astronomy and astrology, and claimed to be able to divine the future. But the important fact to remember here is they were very highly influential in Persia. They were, in fact, advisors to the king. And while they were not kings, it would not be wrong to call them king makers because they, were, they functioned as political advisors to all the Persian rulers. And finally, they are very highly educated men who thought deeply about life, and consequently, it's perfectly legitimate to call them wise men. And so what was the star in the east that they saw, and how did they know that it was his star? Remember, the wise men are students of the sky, and that means they wouldn't have been frightened by anything unusual or appearing suddenly in the sky. It helps to know that in those days, it was not uncommon to associate the birth of a ruler with unusual heavenly phenomena. The star, whatever it was, would have made perfect sense to them and would have fit perfectly with what they already believed. You might say that if God wanted to get a message to these pagan priests, he picked the perfect way. But still, what is that star? And we don't know exactly. The Greek word aster is a general one, and it refers to any bright object in the sky. So aster could have referred to a star, a planet, a meteor, a comet, or was it a supernatural light? And that suggests that the star was not a natural phenomena at all, but rather a light placed by God, especially for the Magi to see. In other points in history, we know that God has revealed himself as a bright light in order to guide his people. People see signs of God every day. We see it in sunsets that steal our breath away. We see it in newborn babies. But do we see the sign to draw nearer to God? The wise men understood the purpose of this sign. And if God can use a star to reach these pagan astrologers, he can use anything to reach anybody. The ultimate aim of all of God's messages, both miraculous and written, is to shed the light of heaven on Jesus. So why have these magi traveled so far from home? It was a journey of thousands of miles from Persia to Israel. So why have they made such a treacherous journey? The answer? They have come to see the baby born king of Jews. This is fascinating. They know that this baby has been born, but not where. And they knew he was a king, but they didn't know his name. So there's no way under heaven that the Magi traveled thousands of miles across the desert by themselves. Because in those days, the only way you could travel in the desert was in a large caravan. At minimum, they would have brought a full military escort and all their servants. And the total caravan would have numbered more than 300 men. Having spent nearly two years preparing for this trip and the huge amount of money for supplies and transportation, they would have swept into Jerusalem with much pomp and circumstance. And needless to say, the Magi had no trouble gaining an audience with Herod to ask him for direction. So Herod had been called the King of Jews by the Senate in Rome for almost 40 years, but no one called him the Messiah because Messiah means long-awaited God anointed ruler. The Messiah would overcome all other rule and bring an end to history and establish the kingdom of God and never die and never lose his reign. Herod was called Herod the Great for keeping peace and stability in his region. He was a brilliant architect. He stopped taxes to help his people, and during tough famines, he melted his own gold to help the starving people. But we know that he had a deep flaw in his character. He was a very suspicious man. He could not tolerate rival people or people plotting against me. He had his own wife murdered. He had three of his sons assassinated. So when these three visitors from the East arrive looking for the king of Jews, we can just imagine his reaction. To him, there's only one king of the Jews. 
These men are not searching for a mere ordinary human successor to Herod. They're searching for the final king, to end all kings, the king of all nations, not just Israel, the king for all of us, not just Jews. So as the wise men set out for Bethlehem, they'd already come, overcome so many barriers to get to Jesus. There was the cultural barrier, a distance barrier, a language barrier, a racial barrier, not to mention their recent encounter with this hostile king. It wasn't easy for them to find Jesus, but they did. And if the wise men can find Jesus, then so can we. So with only six miles left to reach Bethlehem, the star they saw in the east suddenly reappears. The scripture is very specific. It says, the star went on before them until it came and it stood over the very home where the baby Jesus was. Friends, the star led them to the right house. That does not sound like any natural star to me, but a miraculous star created by God to lead the Magi. No wonder they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. The end of their long, hard journey was at hand. And they came to the house where the child was and saw him with his mother Mary. And they bowed down and they worshipped him. Friends, behold the first Christian worshippers. The simple dwelling became a cathedral. Seekers of Christ found him and they knelt in his presence. There beside his mother revealed nothing more than a normal baby, gurgling and cooing, his tiny hands moving side to side, maybe reaching eagerly for his mother's breast. He was not born into a wealthy family. He wasn't born in a temple. He wasn't wrapped in kingly garments and he wasn't surrounded by dignitaries. But somehow the Magi saw past that, beyond the present, and into, into the future, and in deep faith they worshipped him. They saw that this child would one day rule the world, and they were not ashamed to fall on their faces before him. So there are four pieces of worship grounded in this text. First, the Magi ascribe authority to Christ by calling him the King of Jews. In verse 2, Todd read, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? And second, the Magi ascribe dignity by falling down before him. In verse 11, it says, After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell to the ground and they worshipped him. Falling down to the ground is what you do to say to someone else, You are high and I am low. And third, in verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly and with great joy. Friends, they rejoiced because they were seeing the Messiah. They were worshiping and they were doing it joyfully because something about Christ is so desirable. And finally, they and we worship by giving sacrificial gifts. So we know that the Magi brought three gifts to give to Jesus. They were especially appropriate because of their symbolism. One was the gift of gold, Definitely fit for a king. Gold, pure, valuable, and nearly indestructible. Indeed, a royal medal. And in the ancient world, it's even rarer than it is today. And then there's frankincense, a gift for a priest, because since it's mixed with oil, it's used to anoint other priests. And in Jesus' day, frankincense was used as an offering of thanksgiving and praise to God in temple worship. And the final gift was myrrh, not hummus. It was used to prepare dead bodies for burial. The corpse was wrapped in layers of cloth and spices were placed between the layers to cover the odor of decay. And this final gift foreshadows the suffering Jesus was to endure on the cross in fulfillment of his role as savior. So what else is significant about these gifts? Their practicality. These gifts were all portable. They could be carried and easily sold on this long unexpected journey to Egypt. The gifts enabled Jesus' poor parents to travel. And if the wise men offered Jesus gifts fit for a king, then so should we. It is good to remember that the tradition of giving gifts at Christmas time did not start with Santa Claus. It started with the wise men. So often we get caught up in giving and receiving, and we forget where it all began. Beloved, we have just celebrated again the birth of Jesus Christ. We have been reminded of God's eternal presence with us through Emmanuel. We've sung songs, we've baked cookies, we've opened gifts, all in honor of our Savior's birth. 
Perhaps through the season, we have even felt the wonderful warmth and assurance of Christ being born in our own hearts and lives, either for the first time or the 50th. So what are we going to do about this? It is good to give gifts to each other. It is even better to give gifts to Jesus. It is good to show our love to those we love. It is even better to show love to the one who loved us, even when we are unlovable, even when we are unloving. Did you remember Jesus on your gift list this Christmas? Did you set aside a gift worthy of a king? We worship one another and ourselves instead of worshiping God. We worship stuff. And when we do that, our lives are broken by debt, by jealousy, and broken dreams. And then Jesus came to give us life. And the way we experience that life is by giving to God in the same way that God has given to us. We should give God the best that he has implanted in our minds and in our hearts. Our precious spiritual graces and gifts should all be offered in the service of Christ. The sight of Christ not only leads heart to worship, but willing hands to give. True worship simply does not exist apart from sacrifice, because those who worship give. Jesus taught us to think of his brethren, those poorer than ourselves. We can make someone happy by loving them, by showing love to those we love. We show love to the one who loved us. And when you give gifts to Christ like this, it's a way of saying this. I have not come to you for things, but for yourself. I have a hope of enjoying you more, not these things. By giving up what you do not need, you are saying, you are my treasure, not these things. So what happened to those wise men after they worshiped Jesus and gave him their gifts? And the text tells us they departed to their own country by another way. After they worshiped Jesus, their lives were never the same. They followed a star and they did so because they felt this child would change their lives. This king would make their lives better. And we all have stories about Jesus and how he's changed our lives. But there are other people out there who need someone like you or I to help them sense that need, to pray to or to go to them and pray with them, to show them the power of the risen Christ that cares for their hurts and their pains. Friends, we have the most important thing in the world at our fingertips, and nothing should stop us from sharing Jesus' love with others. Not distance, not language, not color of skin, nor any other barrier can keep us from sharing God's love with others. And so finally, the Magi make their way home, back to their everyday lives. But they did not leave Jesus behind. They took the experience of the, their encounter with him with them. And that's true for all of us, that once we meet Jesus, we do take another road, and life is never the same again. And so may God take the story of the wise men and waken in us a desire for Christ himself. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, you are the Messiah, the King of all nations. We come and bow down before you. God breaks through our world to see that you are worshiped. He will not leave us in the dark. He is the pursuer, the teacher. Therefore, whatever opposition I may find, I joyfully ascribe authority and dignity to you, and I bring my gifts to say that you alone can satisfy my heart, not these. When God sends us signs, may we be faithful. Let them lead us to scripture. Let scripture lead us to worship, and let worship lead us home. Thank you, God, for the countless ways that you have blessed our lives. Amen.